Good morning, everyone, from Ford City, Pennsylvania. This is Chuck King bringing you the Daily Bible Study on Wednesday, January 13th, 2021. This is study number 303 from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 35 through the end of the chapter, in verse 58. But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And of what kind of body do they come? So the Corinthian church had questions among the, the believers about the resurrection. They were ignorant about the resurrection. Some of them didn't, didn't believe there was even resurrection from the dead. And so the questions were coming and Paul was answering them. How are the dead raised and what kind of body do they come? And he says, you fool, he called them a fool, Those, uh, the church. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So there's always the principle of first death, then the resurrection. We see that with Jesus. We see that in with us in our water baptism. We have to die to ourselves to be raised to new life. And, and that's a picture of the resurrection. Our body must die eventually physically, and then we are raised by the power of God. And what, verse 37, that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. So like planting a seed in the ground that first has to disintegrate for the seed to begin to grow to a new life, he's using that, that metaphor uh, to describe our the resurrection of our bodies. Verse 38, But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. So it's God's choosing, God's doing, how we live, how we die, how we will be raised again. Verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of of birds and another fish. So Paul's kind of giving a little, you know, a lesson in zoology here uh, and biology to show the different categories that people knew about from observing creation. Not detailed here, but he's saying that every 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 category of life is a bit different. Verse forty: There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. So the, even besides earth, we've got heavenly heavenly creations, heavenly bodies that are different. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. Talking about the actual planets and the stars, how they are different as God created them. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead, and speaking of human beings, believers who were, who were raised from the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. So we know we die and turn to dust, so to speak. But then the resurrection creates a, a, an eternal, imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So first the natural, then the spiritual. That's the principle that God has revealed to us. And we first have that natural body that we're living in, and when it dies there will be a resurrection and a new spiritual body that will last forever. Verse 45, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And that, of course, is from Genesis 2. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, comparing Adam again with Jesus. However, verse 48, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. So there's the principle, the natural, then the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. So we have that 
distinction once again. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. So that difference between heavenly eternal beings and earthly temporal beings is very clear. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also bear the image, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So first the natural and then the spiritual. Verse number 50. Now I say this, brethren, that, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So you can't you can't live in heaven in the presence of God in in your in the kingdom of God in your earthly temporary human body. Verse 51 Behold, I tell you a mystery, which is something that's hard to understand that must be revealed to us by God Himself. We will not all sleep or die but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. We have all the prophetic words throughout Old and New Testament about the, the coming of Jesus. And at the coming of Jesus, he will raise his people, his church, from the dead, and if, and those who are still alive, believers that are still alive, at that moment will be changed after the dead in Christ are raised. So that's the order. The dead will be raised, and we will be changed, meaning those who are still alive, that won't die first, but will be transformed in an instant, in, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, at the last trumpet. There's a lot of debate about when that will be in the timing, but it's not up to us. It's up to God. And we need to be ready. We need to be watching for him. We need to be about the Father's business. And uh, nothing else will matter. And this is why we have to avoid being caught up in all these foolish things on the earth. We have to be about the Father's business and be be uh, doing his will and work when he comes. Verse 53, for this perishable, meaning the, the, old, the old earthly body, must put on the imperishable, which is the resurrected body, and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And that's, that's a quote from, uh, let me see where that comes from. Isaiah 25, verse 8. Death is swallowed up in victory. This is the prophetic promise that death will, will not hold us, but rather the resurrection will take place for every believer. O, o death, verse 55, from Hosea 13, verse 14. O death, where is your victory? Question. O death, where is your sting? Another question. The resurrection will solve uh, death's hold on everyone. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. So the wages of sin is what brings death and causes death. And the law exposes, as we've already studied that, the law exposes our sin and reveals that we are, we are sinners worthy of judgment. But the grace of God that transforms us through Jesus Christ, now through the born-again, spirit-filled, sanctified experience, uh, with the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, and eventually will raise us from the dead, that, that power of God removes the sting of death and the power of sin. 
verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our victory. And faith is the victory. Faith in him is the victory that overcomes everything of this world system, the attacks of the enemy, all, all the things that would try to separate us from him. It's the, it's the grace of God and the presence of God, the koinonia fellowship and, and the, the, the grace and the mercy and the peace that he imparts to us that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to. We don't need to fret about death. People, people live in fear of death their whole lives, and when you don't know Jesus, th there's no hope, nothing to look forward to except what's right here. And uh, as you get older, you know that that coming event uh, of of death is is causes great fear in people. But because of the victory of Jesus Christ. And his power to raise us from the dead, we are filled with praise and thanksgiving and expectation of eternal life in his presence. And that's why this last verse, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So after this very interesting and powerful teaching on on resurrection to the church at Corinth, because they had confusion and, and ignorance about the resurrection from the dead, beginning with, of course, the importance of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, but also of the, the prophetic promises that he will raise all of, of us with him to live with him forever in his presence. And so what do we do with that as the backdrop of our eternity before us, the hope of eternal life and that, that we can't even understand, but we look so look forward to. And I might add that, you know, as you get older, you look forward to it much more because uh, physically you realize time is running out. But Paul says, with all of this teaching, including this teaching of, of the coming of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead believers and the translation or the, the rapture of, of those who are still alive, at that time, he says, this is what you should do. Beloved brethren, be steadfast. Steadfast. That means, that means we, don't, we don't move, we don't drift, we don't change. We instead, we continue to put on the full armor of God that we might stand against the evil forces. And the armor of God, you know, provides us with uh, the, 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 the clothing or, or the garments of Jesus Christ, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the readiness of the gospel and the shield of faith to quench all the, the attacks of the enemy, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and prayer in the Spirit, all kinds of prayer on this and every occasion, we must continue to stand, to be steadfast, to take our stand in the, in the battle, in the war, a spiritual war, not a war with people, or with politicians, or dictators, or communists, or whoever. We're not fighting against people, but we must be steadfast in the calling that he has given us, and the gifting he has given us. It says immovable. Don't allow anything to move you away from the will of God for your life. The only thing that matters is the will of God. And remember, Jesus said, I've only come to say the words that he's given me to say and to do the things he has shown me to do. And we should be the same. We should be desirous, to, desiring to always do the will of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
As a result, he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The work we should be doing should be the, the work that he calls us to do. And that, that's, that's why we need to become students of the New Testament so we will know how he has called us and what he's commanded us to do and how those first century church brethren pioneered uh, the ministries and the, the Great Commission around the world. We've got to stop being distracted by worldliness, by the wisdom of this world, by the things of this world, by, by all, and you know, the, the world, all they do is fight with each other, constant divisions, hatred, bitterness. These are all symptoms of a fallen world system that is under the judgment of God. But we should be abounding in the work of the Lord. Share your testimony. Preach the gospel. Teach the word of God. Make disciples. Love everyone. Reach out to the poor. How, how many scriptures, both Old and New Testament, urge us to, to be kind and loving to the poor, especially those who are believers, and not only here, but among the nations. And, and we have to know that our work, our toil, our labor will never be in vain if we do it for him. We are laying up treasure in heaven every time we serve other people, every time we obey his word. So listen, the one verse here, this last verse is so important for the church uh, today in 2021. We must be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And you know what he's called us to do. Do it with all of your might. God loves a cheerful giver. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So personally take on that motivation to be a generous giver. And certainly you should give to someone who needs it, not someone who has more than you have. The biblical, uh, the biblical standard for giving is to always give to someone who is poorer than you are. Not to give your money to some rich evangelist or some prophet or apostle that's living high on the hog and using the tithes and offerings of the people to enrich himself. No, give it to those who have a greater need. Give it to, to ministries that are serving the poor, that are reaching out, preaching the gospel, making disciples, planting churches, sending out workers, these are the fundamentals of the New Testament. And we, if you just read the book of Acts, I read it every month. You, just, you read the whole New Testament every month, like I do, and you will see this definite pattern of ministry and outreach with, with, with great zeal and, and fervency and toil and labor and suffering in order to do it for the Lord, not for themselves, not to make a name for themselves or to build a kingdom on this earth, but to honor and glorify the Lord by loving his people. That's why we have to preach the truth to them. We can't hold anything back. We can't spin anything and give them partial information and only tell them what they need to hear. We need to preach the word in season and out of season. And we need to correct and rebuke and encourage one another. We need to be accountable to the body of Christ. We can't just be playing games or for appearance sake want everyone to love us because we are so nice to them. But we need to preach the gospel, the word of God, insist on the standard of scripture so that the Lord will be glorified and that our fruit in this life will be laid up as treasure in heaven. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the revelation of Scripture on the resurrection from the dead. 
And Lord, we are so dependent on you. Every breath we take comes by your mercy and grace. And we wait upon you for the rest of our lives here on earth that we might be productive and bear fruit that remains and glorify you and be about your work as faithful stewards of the gospel and be ready for the coming of Jesus. Be ready for that great day when you raise us up or transform us if we're still alive into the eternal beings that you've called us to be. Father, we look to you with great praise and worship and adoration, and we, we just want to glorify you, and we ask you to help us all as your people, your bride, your church, to become all that you want us to be, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as in heaven. We ask and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there's the teaching that completes 1 Corinthians 15. Please share it on, <clears throat> on YouTube, from YouTube, or from Facebook, or if you're on MeWe, like we've just begun, some of us have just started working there. You, you can see uh, the teachings and videos there as well. May the Lord bless and keep you. Again, don't be distracted by the lies of the devil, by fake news. By Their lies abound everywhere, fake news everywhere. Christians are spreading completely ridiculous things that they can't possibly say are true or will come to pass. Be steadfast on the Word of God. Don't get distracted by worldly things and keep preaching the gospel. God bless you.